In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This Sunday has many names. It's called Refreshment Sunday because historically, when people were much more serious about fasting than they are nowadays, and since this is about halfway through Lent, fasting was somewhat relaxed. Sometimes it's simply called Mid-Lent. The name from our Catholic tradition is Laetari Sunday, from the Latin word rejoice, from the first word of the introit of the Latin mass. The scripture verse is Isaiah 66, 10. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. That's an exclamation of praise by the return of the Jews from exile in Babylon to Mother Jerusalem. And then by extension of the Mother Jerusalem idea, in England today is known as Mothering Sunday a time when people return to their home parish, their mother church. So in England, this is Mother's Day. <laughs> and in the liturgy, there is a lightening of the somber tone of Lent. For example, in place of the usual violent vestments, rose-colored vestments may be used. When St. John wrote his gospel, he approached Jesus' miracles differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He not only describes the wonder of the miracle, but he also emphasizes the symbolism in the miracle. In other words, he shows that the miracle has a meaning far beyond what you see on the surface. For example, the healing of the blind man in today's gospel is a sign which shows that Jesus is the light which has come into the darkness of the world. It's a healing miracle, but John gives a theological meaning. Jesus told the man to wash the mud off his eyes in the pool Siloam. In the text, John tells us that the name of the son, uh, the name of the pool Siloam means sent. He puts that in parenthesis. I mean, it's in parenthesis in the in the Bible. It's a symbol of Jesus being sent from God to give us light. The washing in the pool of Siloam is an image of baptism, and Lent is an appropriate time to think about our baptisms, of being buried with Christ in his death through our baptisms. Lent is the traditional time when catechumens in the early church were prepared for baptism. The catechumen is a pro is a program of preparing adults for baptism that has been restored in the Roman Catholic Church and is being recovered in our own church as well. In churches where catechumens have been prepared through prayer and study, they will be baptized at the service called the Easter Vigil. Carefully observing this season of Lent with fasting and acts of penitence represents for us, as it were, a time of darkness before we were baptized. Our participation in Lent prepares us to truly celebrate, by contrast, the season of light, which is the great 50 days of Easter, a time of new birth, a time of sharing with Christ in his resurrected glory. And that Easter season of 50 days is so much more than just one day to wear some really nice clothes to church. <laughs> 21 years ago, when I was your rector, the Anglican Digest was sent free for a year to all the members of St. James from our address list that we sent them. And according to the Anglican Digest office, 16 of those members are still getting this little quarterly magazine now 21 years later. I asked the publishers to send enough copies of this issue. You have a copy? Good. <laughs> I was hoping because they did send it. There's an article on page 23 by Bishop Daniel Martins, the retired bishop of the Diocese of Springfield, Illinois. I hope you will read that article, not now. 
<laughs> I hope you will read that article where he compares a musical composition that has three movements with the last three days in Holy Week. Those three days called the Tritum are Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and the Great Vigil of Easter. I will be here. I'm blessed by that, by being asked to do that. I'm very ha happy and blessed to be there, to be here for that. Uh, I will be the celebrant of the Great Vigil this year. And if you have never experienced that service, I encourage you to do so. It is a service of darkness and light which dramatically emphasizes in darkness the time before the resurrection, and then in the light, Christ's resurrected glory. We will renew our baptismal covenant, and there will be a baptism. Praise God. And then with the first mass of Easter, we will celebrate the Christian Passover from death to life. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. And we keep that feast on Easter even with alleluias. <laughs> You've not been using alleluias for 40 days now, or more, not quite 40. In today's gospel, the blind man represents all people. You see, we are all born blind. But there's an opportunity for Christ's light to break into our lives. Most of us were baptized as infants. I, I think, maybe, maybe most, maybe not. But there's an opportunity for Christ's light to break into our lives. Baptism is not some kind of magical rite that automatically guarantees that one will follow the light of Christ. There will also must be a response of faith when we were able to see, oh, now I see. <laughs> All are blind until Christ's light opens our eyes. It may be a gradual process, perhaps beginning at baptism, which was my case, perhaps much later, even after baptism, or it may be begin before baptism, or maybe something like St. Paul experienced on the road to Damascus, when he was blinded by a very bright light causing him to lose his sight. A disciple named Ananias laid hands on him with prayer and immediately he could see. And then he was baptized. It's different for each of us. After the blind man had washed in the pool and received his sight, he was still somewhat confused by his situation. But the more he thought about it, the more he was questioned about it, the more he believed. Many of the Jews were skeptical that the man had really been healed. They asked his parents, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents replied, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. When the son was asked, he responded, one thing I know, I was blind. Now I see. Even with the gift of sight, how much do you and I truly see? We can fail so often to understand what is happening around us and within us. We take life for granted. We grow older and more cynical. We look for rational explanations, like the young man's parents. Even when confronted with a miracle, we sometimes do not accept our Lord Jesus as the source of that miracle. We often just rationalize some reasonable explanation. This is one of the things that has attracted me to the Orthodox Church and Orthodox spirituality. They don't try to rationalize God's miracles as we Westerners do. They just accept them. Sometimes we forget or ignore the Christ who offers understanding and who lightens the shadows and who brings good things 
out of darkness and chaos. If miracles always happened when we prayed, they wouldn't be miracles at all. They would just be ordinary expectations of our lives. If God did everything we ask him to do, he would be the master and we, he, and we would be the slave. God would be our slave, that's what I mean, like a genie in a lamp. Miracles, by definition, are not ordinary events. A miracle is what happens that's out of the ordinary. All the blind people of Jesus' day were not cured of their blindness, but some were. Miracles are extraordinary, but they do occur. We should pray for miracles to happen and expect them to happen, and sometimes they will. God will always answer our prayer, not always with a miracle, but he will always answer our prayer. Sometimes we pray about something that is troubling us, maybe something that seems impossible to understand or impossible to withstand. And then suddenly one day we realize that everything's resolved. Something happens to shed light in our darkness. At those times we can say, one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Now I understand. St. James Tutoring Program at Eugene Field School introduced me to tutoring. I didn't do that when I was rector. I I did in the last few months I was here because I thought, oh well. (laughs) I read someplace that Senator Ted Kennedy uh, went from his office, which was near Capitol Hill, It was on Capitol (laughs) Hill. But he went to an elementary school, which was close by, and did tutoring, reading. He tutored, he read to people, children. And he convinced his staff to do the same. And they began. So the school was overwhelmed with with Ted Kennedy's. I I thought, if a senator can take time once a week to do tutoring, I can certainly do that especially since I'm about to retire. (laughs) And so I did. And what's amazing to me is I'm just, uh, I'm a math tutor. (laughs) For third graders. It's Eugene Field Elementary School. And uh, when I explain something to them, in order to try to help them remember it so they're not just rote memorizing it. That you can see the light dawn in their face. You can just see it. Ah, and they'll never forget that. I love it. Light, light pierces the darkness at dawn each day. Spring bursts into bloom after the cold of winter and we are scarcely conscious of the exact moment it happens. I wish it would happen soon. Sometimes it's like that when light dawns in our lives, when spring comes in our lives, we know things are different, sometimes miraculously different. Someone suffering from alcoholism finds sobriety, a troublesome child becomes a, a responsible adult, a marriage is restored after estrangement and bitterness, a person finds this new sense of fulfillment at his or her work, someone who is seriously ill becomes well, Light pierces the darkness, spring bursts into bloom, and Christ, the light of the world, gives us vision and understanding to live as children of light in this dark world. As we sang in the hymn just before the gospel, when we have run with patience the race, we shall know the joy of Jesus. In him there is no darkness at all, the night and the day, are both alike. So pray for miracles to happen and expect them to happen. And when they do occur, we may not know how those things are accomplished, but we can say with the son who was given his sight, one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. 
and miracles have a significance far beyond the actual wonder of the miracle itself. When we observe a miracle in someone else's life, or in our own lives, it should serve as a pointer to God who is responsible for it. So we're granted two gifts at the same time, the wonder of the miracle itself and a fresh experience of God's power and grace and mercy. Miracles should help open our eyes and strengthen our faith in the one who will always bring light out of darkness. And finally, in the story, when the Pharisees put the man out of the synagogue, excommunicated him for daring to give them advice, at a time when he was rejected and alienated from his fellow Jews, Jesus found him. Jesus found him. The man did not find Jesus. He wasn't even looking for him. Jesus found him. That's one of the deepest truths of the Christian faith. Even at our darkest hour, Jesus finds us. Jesus welcomed the man into his fellowship. And he did it by asking point blank, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he responded, I believe, Lord. And then he worshiped him. And then he worshiped him. How do we respond today, respond today when Jesus finds us and brings us peace or brings us healing? Jesus finds us, no matter how alienated we feel or how hurt or how discouraged or how sick. He may not bring us a miracle in just the way we ask for it, but he will always bring light out of the darkness of the lives of all those who see him with eyes of faith and who worship him. How do we respond when Jesus finds us? John said that the man's response was, Lord, I believe, and then he worshiped him. When we truly are believers in Jesus Christ in our hearts, not just giving lip service to church membership or church attendance, when we truly believe in our hearts, then we will respond by worshiping him. Believing Christians are worshiping Christians. Believing congregations are worshiping congregations. He will always bring light out of the darkness of our lives, and our response should always be to worship him, him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.